Okay. Uh, Eric, go ahead and share your screen and get your slides up. So um, Eric Johnson started his ornithological career stewarding and monitoring breeding lease terns and piping plovers in Massachusetts and has returned to these coastal routes by leading the development of a comprehensive beach nesting bird stewardship program in Louisiana in partnership with other organizations and local communities. He was telling us that he was just working with the black skimmers just today. And I'm sure he'll tell us about that. He's active in Louisiana's birding community and serves as Louisiana's Christmas Bird Count Regional Editor, a member of Louisiana's Bird Records Committee, Vice President of Baton Rouge Audubon Society, and co-director of the Louisiana Bird Observatory. Um, he lives in Lafayette, uh, Louisiana. And I will let you tell the rest, Eric. Thank hey, you so Chris, much. I'm going to back for tomorrow's boat ride period. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this for us. Sure, I'm happy to do it. Thanks for the invite, Deborah. It's good to see you. It's, thanks for everybody for joining this evening. So um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about our little swamp candle, the Perthonotary Warbler, the star of our show. Uh, the one on the left here is a singing male. Um, you can distinguish them from the females, which you can see on the right, um, which have kind of a duller head, a little bit more muted colors, but are still just equally gorgeous. So um, I've been working with this bird for now almost 10 years, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the work that um, my team has been doing in Louisiana, but also how our Prothonotary Warbler Working Group um, has been trying to, to uh, advance the, the knowledge about this bird um, across its breeding range and even its wintering range. So this is a species that is what we consider a secondary cavity nester. That means that they do not build their own cavities. They rely on other um, things to happen in order to lay their eggs in those cavities. So on the left there, you can see it's an old hollowed out area in a cypress knee um, that made a good nesting site. And all the way on the right, uh, they will also use the cavities made by other species. So Carolina chickadees, um, even downy woodpeckers uh, will make cavities and, and prothonotaries will take advantage of those. So, um, so yeah, so they don't have the, the bill to be able to do it. Um, but once they arrive in, in late March, so right now we're starting to see our first prothonotary warblers come back to South Louisiana, across the Gulf Coast. Uh, they'll continue to arrive over the next few weeks and start laying eggs. Their clutch size is about three to six eggs. Uh, the female is the only one who incubates. Um, the males, when they arrive, they start to scout and look for uh, potential cavity sites in their in their territory, and they'll drop a little piece of moss in, and then when the female comes, they'll they'll choose that site together, and so she'll lay up to six eggs and incubate the uh, incubate those eggs for about two weeks, um, and when the hatch when they hatch, the the chicks are are naked, their eyes are closed. But within 11 days, they are feathered and ready to jump out of the box to face the world. Uh, the parents will continue provisioning and feeding those young for up to 35 days after pledging. And at least in South Louisiana and Arkansas, we've, we've been able to determine that they can re-nest up to three times. They can have three successful broods per season. Whereas as you go further north to say Ohio, they can only do one single brood per season. Um, the summer is just too short up there for them to have multiple broods. So, so that in itself is kind of interesting. It's something the working group is, is kind of looking into. Um, but like I say, the male kind of begins the nest building process. He'll, he'll scout and, and select various cavity sites. Here you can see a nest being constructed in once in, inside of one of our nest boxes. Um, and then the female will kind of finish off the nest with a lining. And, and in many of our sites, they seem to prefer to use last year's cypress needles where they'll line the cup uh, um, of, the, uh, of the nest. And here's another example of a, of a box that we've provided for them. This time it's a 64 ounce Tupperware container. So they're, they're pretty adaptable. They'll use almost anything you'll give them. Um, so like Deborah said, I'm, I'm based in Lafayette, Louisiana. 
And um, so I've been doing work with with them in Louisiana for for about 10 years, like I said, and Louisiana is such an important place for this species. Um, we estimate that about, you know, Ebert estimates that about 21% of the entire global nesting population uses Louisiana um, to raise their young. So we have a disproportionate responsibility for the survival of this species. Um, and you can see the two main real regions of distribution for this bird are along the lower Mississippi River, Alluvial Valley, um, and then also the Eastern Coastal Plain from about Maryland down through uh, Northeast Florida. Um, so as many of you probably know, uh, many migratory birds are in steep decline. And so that is why folks like myself and the Audubon Society and other organizations are are working on these birds to try to figure out how to bring them back. Um, we already know so much about what to do, but there are interesting nuances and things to learn about how these birds may be responding or adjusting or not to climate change and other kinds of emerging threats. Um, so we've lost about 3 billion birds over the last 50 years or so. That's about 29% of all of the avifauna of the US and Canada. And so if you go to 3billionbirds.org, it's a fantastic website that sort of lays out um, the causes of these declines, um, but then also provides seven easy things that people can do to help bring these birds back. Um, so it's a really, really important resource um, if you're interested in, in conserving these migratory birds. 40% um, of, of birds that winter in South America have declined, so an even higher proportion than, say, the overall average. And prothonotary warblers is one of those birds in the 40% range. So um, this is what the population's trend look, trends look like over the last uh, 50 years, according to the Breeding Bird Survey data. Um, so it's about 0.7% per year, um, or about 31%. Um, the good news is that their populations do seem to have stabilized over the last you know, decade or so, a little bit longer. So um, the declines were, you know, aren't as rapid as they were um, in the 60s and 70s. Um, but one of the interesting things that we started to realize when we compared the rates of decline um, against the loss of bottomland forest habitat in the United States is that the pace was, was much faster than the rate of forest loss, suggesting that there's other things going on. And when we look at winter habitat loss like mangroves, the correlation um, becomes much stronger. So it, there's a strong possibility that a lot of what's driving the declines of um, this species is, is happening on the wintering grounds or at least on the migratory grounds when they're using um, habitats outside, outside of the United States. And of course we know that, you know, even though those counts only go back to 1960, the majority of habitat loss uh, that this bird was affected by happened well before that. So the lower Mississippi River alluvial valley was largely cleared in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and only 20% of it remained um, by, 19, by the 1960s. And of course, it fueled economic growth and agricultural expansion. Um, major cities uh, you know, were, were built around this kind of economy. The Mississippi River itself is a critical shipping and navigation um, channel for, for, for our US economy. Um, but the consequences is just the loss of these birds. Um, and of course, avian extinction. So we've you know, even seen the, the loss of Backman's warbler, which depended on these kinds of habitats, and ivory bill woodpecker. And I would love to chat ivory bill woodpecker on another day if people would like to, but uh, <laughs> the latest science suggests that it is extinct. Um, I know there's hope out there, and boy, am I hopeful too. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is how we've been advancing sort of the science and understanding of prothonotary warbler ecology, uh, how we've been using community science to enhance breeding habitat. Um, and then I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about how we're restoring critical habitat here in Louisiana to support this bird. So I'll start off with the science of warbler ecology. And those questions are going to connect to uh, these three topics. So migratory connectivity, so learning about the migrations of these birds. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the regional and habitat variation in nestling diet. So we've been doing some cool stuff there. And then I'm going to give you a little preview on some new work that's emerging um, to start to understand how resilient these birds may be to, to climate change. 
So I'm going to start with migration research piece. Um, this is a, a beautiful male prothonotary warbler that returned after a year of carrying this device called a geolocator. I'm going to talk about what that is. Um, but first, we know that prothonotary warblers are not in the United States in winter. The geniuses at eBird put this wonderful map together, showing the distribution and the arrival of, of prothonotary warblers in the spring. And they're largely gone from the continent by by September, October, um, and you know, to our south in the in the winter time, in our winter time. So I just love how this uh, lights up, showing just the important places across the southeastern United States for this for this species. Um, and we honestly don't know a whole lot about the wintering range of the prothonotary warbler. Um, we kind of know where, where they show up during the non-breeding season, but we don't have a good sense of how important those various places are. And there's even gaps in, in some of the distributional knowledge, um, just because some of these places are so hard to access. So this is a, a mangrove forest in, uh, in Panama um, that just exemplifies just, just how impossible it would be for an ornithologist to reliably work in there, much less bird watchers to go in and do you know full inventories of what's around. So a lot of these wintering habitats are really, really challenging to work in and have been a limiting factor in, in our understanding of their winter ecology and even just basic things like their winter distribution. So I mentioned that we have these tools now called the geolocator um, that we can use to track the migrations um, and, the, and the wintering locations of birds that breed across the eastern United States. A geolocator is a very small device. Um, in this case, the, the ones that we used were about half a gram, um, which is about 3% of the body weight of a prothonotary warbler. And it basically consists of a data logger, it consists of a battery, and it has a light sensor. And that light sensor is taking a light reading every two minutes um, throughout the day and night for as long as that battery lives. So this battery in a half a gram geolocator will last about nine to 12 months. So just long enough um, for a year, you know, a year of data. And when that bird comes back with the geolocator, we have to relocate it. And then we can download the data and uh, use the difference between sunrise and sunset. So when it goes from dark to light, that's sunrise and sunset. And, uh, and then that gives us latitude because that varies across the planet, depending on the date. And then solar noon is the midpoint between sunrise and sunset. And that gives us longitude because the sun always rises earlier in the east. So those basic pieces of information just using light will give us a generalized location of where this bird has been at any given day of the year. Um, but of course, we have to capture those prothonotary warblers. One, to deploy the geolocator, and then two, when that bird comes back and, uh, <laughs> and then try to recover the geolocator. So we use these very convincing decoys and play a, a speaker um, with the song of an intruding male prothonotary into a territory. And lo and behold, we can catch a prothonotary warbler. Um, and most of the time that works a second time as well when the bird comes back a year later. So the bird is quickly extracted out of the net. Uh, we take a bunch of measurements. We give it a unique set of color bands so we know which individual is which. And then for some of the birds, we attach this geolocator. So we use uh, stretch magic, this sort of flexible harness material and, and wrap it around the, the, the upper thighs. And it basically the geolocator sits on the back of a prothonotary warbler like a, um, like a little fanny pack. So the first one that we ever did was deployed in 2013. We actually deployed three geolocators that year just as a trial to see if this was going to work. Uh, it was at Blue Bonnet Swamp Nature Center in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, in this little urban fragment that supported good numbers of prothonotaries. And we didn't attach the first geolocator properly. It promptly fell off the bird. Um, the second geolocator bird promptly disappeared. It might have been a young male that was just dispersing through. Um, but the third bird stuck to its nesting cavity. It raised a whole bunch of babies. And then it disappeared in late August, uh, about the time of when they're supposed to migrate south. 
or I'm sorry, in late July is when they left. So then we just had to play this waiting game in fall of 2023, waiting for them for the return in 2014 to come back. And so that was a long winter. <laughs> um, but fortunately, our one of our primo volunteers, John Hartgering, on March 24th, heard the song of a prothonotary warbler. And the next day, we realized it was that bird. And so we ran out there, dropped everything, and then captured that prothonotary warbler. So um, that was the first bird that was ever tagged. And this is the route that it took. So it left Baton Rouge in late July, um, hung out on the coast for, uh, for a couple of weeks before it flew across the Gulf of Mexico and then went east uh, through the Yucatan Peninsula, um, spent another month there or so, kept going east to Cuba, and then hung out in Jamaica for a month, and then flew across the Caribbean, um, where it finally spent the overwintering period in northwestern Colombia. In early spring, it started coming back at the beginning of March, made a beeline up, up through Central America, departed the Yucatan the night of March 23rd, and was found singing 100 meters away from its previous year's nest box on the afternoon of March 24th. It made a single flight from the Yucatan to Baton Rouge and began setting up its territory in the afternoon of March 24th. Just absolutely remarkable. So this bird spent three and a half months migrating south, three weeks coming back north, a minimum of 5,000 miles traveled, it touched down in at least seven countries and made three major water crossing. Not bad for a bird that weighs the equivalent of five pennies. So meanwhile, that winter, while we were waiting for this important bird to be coming back, um, we started establishing a working group of researchers and conservation-minded individuals and organizations across the Eastern United States. Um, that included an office uh, of Audubon in South Carolina, our office in Louisiana, um, Chris Tonner at, at Ohio State University, Thon Bovis at Arkansas State University, um, uh, folks from Virginia Commonwealth University, Smithsonian, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and others. Um, we're all starting to talk and coordinate. And we, our first mission was to deploy a whole bunch of geolocators from across the breeding range, um, which we did starting in 2014. And we were going to ask questions like, are the eastern population of the birds, right, the, the eastern coastal plains along the Atlantic seaboard, wintering in a different location than the birds in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley? That's a pretty basic and straightforward prediction that you might expect. Um, but we also consider the possibility that you might have some mixing of the wintering grounds. And all of this is really important for understanding where to put your conservation dollars um, if, you're, if you're trying to recover a declining species. And what we basically found was the latter. Uh, they were mixing on the wintering grounds. And in fact, the geolocators that recovered from six states, 88% of those birds overwintered in Northern Columbia. Northern Columbia is where it is at if you are a wintering prothonotary warbler. Um, it was just really surprising to see that concentration of birds um, in that area. We estimate that 20% uh, of the land area on the wintering grounds supports the entire um, breeding population. So the breeding population concentrates itself into 20% of its breeding area. Um, pretty remarkable. While we were doing that, we also were able to understand the important stopover sites, both in, uh, and this is in fall migration, so the Yucatan, the lowlands of Honduras and Guatemala, and then the lowlands of, of Panama and Costa Rica were really important um, migratory stopover areas for, for many of these birds, where they spent a lot of time and, um, and presumably refueling and, and getting energy to make the next move. So we wanted to make sure that this result was accurate. So we took a second approach to also understand um, what we call this, this in, what we call migratory connectivity. So understanding where breeding birds are spending the winter and vice versa, where, where wintering birds are coming from. And for this, we used uh, what's called uh, stable isotopes that are found within the feathers. And so when we were catching birds, um, in this case, both in the United States and our partners were catching birds in um, Costa Rica, Panama, and Colombia. 
um, as well as some of the Caribbean islands and the Lesser Antilles, we were able to analyze those feathers for the ratios of hydrogen isotopes. And the variation of those isotopes changes across the, the United States where these birds are molting those feathers. So in theory, you can more or less understand uh, if you have a bird on the wintering grounds, where that bird has come from based on the ratio of, of hydrogen isotopes inside that feathers. And so um, when we did that, what we basically found, so this is the, the origin of the predicted origin of birds that were caught on the wintering grounds. And basically we have four different wintering regions. We have the Caribbean, Central America, Eastern Colombia, and Western Colombia. And what this basically shows is that there isn't a lot of difference. Basically, there's a lot of mixing on the wintering grounds where you have individuals coming from all different parts of the United States um, to those wintering areas. So it confirmed what we were basically seeing with the geolocator data. So we have two pieces of evidence to suggest that, um, that the migration of prothonotary warblers is actually fairly unique among migratory birds. This is an oven bird. Um, this is a, a, a very common pattern that a lot of uh, migration tracking studies are starting to reveal. Um, that basically Eastern populations and Western populations of, of, my, of these migrating birds are overwintering in different regions. So there's not a lot of mixing on the wintering grounds. Um, and again, I mentioned this has important implications for conservation. So in this particular example, if you're going to protect wintering grounds, say on the Dominican Republic, you're only going to benefit those birds that come from the eastern United States. Um, whereas if you spend resources to in invest in uh, habitat conservation in, say, Guatemala, you're only going to benefit those birds in the, in the western part of the range. In prothonotary warblers, it's quite the opposite. If we invested resources in, say, northern Colombia, we're benefiting prothonotary warblers from across the breeding range. So that it's really helpful to understand those kinds of benefits and consequences of, of where you spend your conservation dollars. And this has actually stimulated a lot of interest in Colombia um, to do mangrove restoration, for example. And we're working with partners and having conversations about how to get that work done. So. Um, that's very, very exciting to see that, that it's already being used for, for practical purposes. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit of a, about our nestling diet work. Um, this is a, just another wonderful photograph by our volunteer, John Hart Grink, uh, showing a male prothonotary warbler bringing a tasty morsel to its nestling. Um, and so what we did here is um, we're asking questions around the, the proportion of the diet that um, comes from aquatic insects versus terrestrial insects. Um, aquatic insects in general offer higher essential fatty acid, acid content than terrestrial insects. What that means for a growing prothonotary warbler is that it has more energy and more nutrients to pull from um, if they're being provisioned aquatic insects. And of course, prothonotary warblers live in wet environments, but those environments aren't always wet. We've altered them through, hyd through hydrologic changes, through dams, um, in all kinds of other ways. And so the hydrology of these systems across the Eastern United States is very different than they were historically. And so, um, so it's important to sort of understand how these birds might be responding to the availability of food in the environment and what kind of consequences that has on, the, on, the, on those nestlings. Um, we were also asking questions about regional, regional differences or seasonal differences. And the way we did this is we basically collected what's called an environmental sample. Um, in this case, it's nestling bird poop. Um, and so we would take a fecal sac from a nestling um, that has DNA in it from all of the food that it was um, just eating. And then um, in the laboratory, we can amplify the DNA out of that low quality sample and get strings of, of, um, uh, of DNA chains. And then we can compare those DNA chains against a reference database of all of the known insects um, in the Eastern United States. And we can assign the, the diet 
you know, we can basically figure out what the diet is of these birds um, using this high throughput DNA processing system. Um, I am not a geneticist. Uh, I don't even play one on TV. So um, our partners at Virginia Commonwealth University were the leads on this. Um, and, a, and a graduate student, uh, Sam Rogers, was the was the uh, was the main um, analyst. So here you can kind of just get a sense of the variety of diet. Each one of these um, complicated uh, scientific words at the bottom is a different group of insects. So Lepidoptera are the butterflies and moths, so probably mostly caterpillars. Araniae are the spiders. Um, Ephemeroptera are the mayflies. Diptera are flies, um, and so on and so forth. And you can see they just eat tons of spiders, tons of caterpillars. Y'all can come on in. And, um, and lots of mayflies. And then the different colors represent the, um, uh, the just the, the diversity within each of those families that we were able to detect in the, in the diet. So, um, so this gives us kind of a first sense of, of what we're looking at. Um, and we basically, this is one of the, the, the bigger takeaways from that project is one, yeah, that we, they consume a wide variety of prey um, we did see that there was some year-to-year -year differences. There were more aquatic insects consumed in the second year of the study in 2019 compared to 2018. Um, and also that there was a shift to non-emergent and terrestrial insects later in the summer, so especially spiders. So in the early part of the spring, they're eating a lot of aquatic insects, uh, which have the high quality uh, fatty acids for the nestlings to grow, but at, through the summer, those conditions got drier and drier and drier and potentially became harder and harder and harder for them. So we're interested in looking at this now and projecting forward, what, is, what are the consequences of climate change going to do with the availability of aquatic insects for this bird? And how might those shifts uh, take place um, over the course of the summer? So that brings me to my third science topic, climate resilience. I mean, you can, you can see just a beautiful prothonotary warbler habitat with some of our nest boxes. Um, and so we're just starting to develop this research. This is kind of the next big push of the, of the working group to figure out um, how, to, how to answer some questions around how resilient this species might be to the effects of climate change. So one, we're going to be looking at the variation of spring arrival. So particularly looking at variation of winter habitat quality. So if you're monitoring nest boxes, um, we would be able to know uh, when the first eggs are laid. And the timing of that seems to be very well correlated with the arrival of the first of the males to those breeding sites. So when the males arrive, usually like three weeks later, you get your first eggs. But that that timing changes from year to year. We can look at that natural variability in the timing and relate that back to various changes that are happening on the wintering grounds and, and look at the those correlated effects. So we're starting to do that. Um, we can look at some of these trade-offs in early and late spring arrival, like around the nestling diet, right? So if they're arriving later, when it's potentially drier in the habitat, does that have consequences on, on breeding success? Um, we can look at how weather affects adult condition and reproductive success. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about that because I have some data to present. And finally, we're also looking at the consequences of late nesting. So if they are arriving later, are they nesting later? And does that have implications on, on molting and fall migration? So we know if birds have to, if, if they have to molt faster, those feathers are lower quality, which could affect adult survivorship. Um, it could affect their ability uh, to find high quality winter habitat and so on and so forth. So there's all these interesting cascading effects that could be happening throughout the life cycle, all affected by a changing climate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this third bullet, how does weather affect adult body conditions? So I've started to look at some data, and I apologize, this is kind of graph heavy, but I'll try to give you a, a good sense of what we're doing here. Um, so we can look at the condition of a bird. This is basically like a body mass index that, that humans are subject to, right? So you go to the doctor, you get your height, and you get your weight measured, and you get a body mass index. We can do the same thing for a bird. Um, the general idea is that during the breeding season, a lighter bird means it's in better condition. It means its food resources are more predictable, so it doesn't have to store fat in order to deal with those unpredictable food uh, resources. Um, but also a lighter bird means it's less likely to get eaten by a sharp-shinned hawk. 
right? It's able to, to negotiate and navigate away from predators. So we wanna see light birds uh, in the breeding season. The other thing we do know from our data um, is that over the course of a day, birds get heavier. So they lose weight overnight and they actually get heavier during the day. So these are actual, uh, this is called mass corrected for body size. That's like the body mass index. So they're getting heavier over the course of the day. So we need to correct for that in any kind of, um, you know, statistical analysis, any kind of uh, evaluation that we do with the data. So we have to put that into a model. The other thing that we've started to look at are these climate oscillation indices. Um, there are three major drivers of how climate in the southeastern United States are affected. So whether it's relatively hot, relatively cool, relatively wet, relatively dry, these are the three main sort of major um, oscillations. So there's the El Nino-La Nina cycle. There's something called the North Atlantic Oscillation. And then there's also the Pacific North American Oscillation. And what we did is started, you basically you get a uh, climatologist produce a monthly index of whether these oscillations are in a positive phase or if they're in a negative phase. And those phases are correlated with whether it's hotter or colder or wetter or drier. Um, and they all interact with each other. And so it is a little bit, you know, complicated, um, but we can take those indices and compare them against our average monthly body mass index for birds and see which, if birds are becoming lighter or heavier in response to these different climate oscillation patterns. Um, so the first one I'm gonna show here, this is the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. So here on the right is the positive phase. Here on the left is the negative phase. Um, and there's a, and basically there's no correlation with changes in body mass index. So this oscillation index doesn't seem to, prothonotaries aren't responding to it. And we saw a very similar pattern with the El Nino La Nina system, what's called the Southern Oscillation. So, so that one doesn't seem to be very important, but when we look at the Pacific North American Oscillation Index, there is a really strong correlation. So in, in periods of time, when this oscillation is in its positive phase, birds are lighter, they're in better body condition. And what that seems to correlate with is wetter and cooler conditions during the summer in the southeastern United States. Prothonotary warblers like it wetter and cooler, which is the opposite of what climate change is going to do to the region. Um, so this is just the Louisiana birds, right? We're at the southern range of the of the breeding system. Um, it'll be we're we're going to start looking at this like in Ohio, in Arkansas, in Virginia, in Wisconsin, and and try to ask some of these same questions um, to see if they may be responding differently in different parts of the range. Is there are they adjusting by maybe shifting? You know, would they be able to adjust by maybe shifting north? Um, so anyway, so this is like a first peak. I've literally never presented this to any other group yet, um, but I'm excited about moving this climate resiliency work forward and, um, and seeing what we come up with. So stay tuned for more. So that wraps up that little segment. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we're enhancing breeding habitat through community science. So this is something that our Audubon chapters are involved in, bird clubs, volunteers, um, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, they're collecting data also that are helping um, with some of these bigger questions too. So because prothonotary warblers are a cavity nester, um, they are really uh, a great species um, to monitor and to, and to put out nest boxes for. Um, and they're really not picky at all, right? Here's an example of a pair using an old light fixture on somebody's front porch. Um, they'll use cardboard boxes they will use an old shoe, they'll use a, um, a coffee can, right? They'll use PVC, they use Tupperware, they use wooden boxes. So almost anything you can think of that has the right dimensions uh, would likely support prothonotary warblers. So here's a couple different examples. It's really important to have your, predator, uh, to have your boxes predator guarded. So don't just staple them to a tree where a snake or a raccoon could get in. Um, so we have these two different methods. One on the left, we use a four by four 
like six or eight foot um, post. And you can, uh, with a post hole digger, put that in the ground and then wrap it with uh, two feet of aluminum flashing. And that does a remarkable job at keeping snakes and, and mammals out. Um, it is really, uh, it is a good way um, for the long term uh, to keep out boxes. It doesn't deteriorate that fast over time. Um, and so it, it's a really great method. It's a little bit more expensive than the alternative method on the right, which is basically like a, a five or six foot um, U post or T post that you can get at Lowe's. You post, post pound that into the ground, uh, screw in a T bar to the top and then use a, a five gallon bucket with the top cut off as the predator guard and then mount your box to that um, upside down bucket. Um, that plastic wears down over time, that T post uh, gets loose over time. And so there's a little bit more maintenance involved in that, but it is cheaper in the upfront. So, um, but those are the two primary methods that we've been using in, in Louisiana and, and both work really well. Um, the other important thing that we do is, is we drill our holes to be one and one quarter inch. Um, one and a half inch is good for things like bluebirds. It's also good for things like brown-headed cowbirds. And so by going to one and a quarter inch, um, we can still get boxes used by prothonotary warblers with really high frequency. And we have literally never in hundreds and hundreds of nesting attempts had a cowbird parasitize that nest, even in places where cowbirds are rampant. So one and a quarter inch is a really good cavity diameter for prothonotary warblers. And we have worked with all kinds of groups. Um, a high school group has mass produced these on multiple occasions. Uh, we have different volunteers that help us with this. It's just a really great community engagement project um, around a really charismatic bird. And um, um, so we've had a lot of fun with that, engaging volunteers in this program. Uh, we have had about 13 different nest box sites across South Louisiana. Um, some of these is where, you know, we've done that geolocator work, where we've done the body condition work, but not necessarily all of them. We have some sites that where we just put out nest boxes, they don't get monitored frequently. We have other boxes that go out that don't have a bander, um, but those boxes get monitored regularly by a volunteer. Um, so we get good high quality nest data. And then other sites are both being monitored regularly and we have a bander nearby um, that can color band adult birds and do some of the additional um, pieces of the project that we do as well. We have also worked with the national park system uh, at Jean Lafitte National Park outside of New Orleans that attracts something like 70,000 volunteers a year. We have trained their interpreters to tell the story of prothonotary warblers, what they need, what they do, their migrations, all of the things that we have learned about them. The National Park has now incorporated it into their interpretive programs that they give to the public. Um, so that was a really fun program. Um, we've worked with a, a very variety of groups. Um, and this example is the Catholic Charities Immigrant Program. Um, we're, uh, we've done some training with them. On, on community science work and also given presentations around uh, um, the, the ecology of this bird. Um, really connecting, like highlighting the connection of birds across the hemisphere, how we're all connected, um, how we care about the places in, in Latin America and South America and Central America. Um, and that, you know, birds are a great way for uniting people across, um, across countries and landscapes. Um, we can also use those data, um, even just basic nest monitoring data to understand, uh, you know, the variation in their breeding productivity from year to year. Um, for, so in this case, in 2018, you know, we had 78.2% nest success, which is about twice as high as natural cavities. So we're doubling the, by having these predator guarded boxes out there, we're doubling the productivity of this species um, compared to what it would use in the wild. Um, where it's more, where they're more vulnerable to to natural predators. Um, other ways that that data can be really useful to this project is is through a program called NestWatch. So even if you aren't necessarily like incorporated into the prothonotary warbler working group, or you you know, or you're really interested in any bird that nests in your backyard or your favorite park. Um, nestwatch.org, uh, which is maintained by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, is a really, really wonderful community science project or program 
um, where it can take all your nest success data. Um, and we're actually going to start mining Nest Watch a little bit for prothonotary warbler nest data to see if we can add that into our climate resiliency work. So it's a great community science tool. Of course, eBird is another one. Um, eBird data are being used uh, for so many different purposes these days to ask big questions about population changes, about range shifts, around all kinds of stuff. So um, definitely, if you're a birder, keep you know, continue to use eBird or start using eBird. Um, it's a really, really valuable contribution to, to bird conservation. Okay, and I'll finish off by just talking a little bit about how we're restoring critical habitat for prothonotary warblers. Um, and this goes beyond just putting predator guarded boxes out in the out in the swamp. So so coastal Louisiana is, you know, the backdrop to this is, is that we're in a land loss crisis. Um, we've lost an area equivalent to the size of Delaware to open water in the last 80 years. Um, that's about 2,000 square miles or 4,800 kilometer squares. Um, and so without restoration action, the future of coastal Louisiana is, is pretty dire, frankly. Um, but there is really a lot of work going into trying to, trying to restore the habitat um, and to restore ecological process. And so the way that Louisiana got here is, is the fundamental reason is, is basically that we levied the Mississippi River. The, the river built this coastal landscape and it did so by overflowing its banks every so often. Um, and of course, with that overflowing water, there's sediment, there's nutrients um, and there's land building capability in that river. And the river would shift every thousand years or so and create a new delta lobe. It would abandon it and find the new path of least resistance, create a new delta lobe and, and really built South Louisiana. Um, but by levying the river and, and forcing it down a single uh, trajectory, uh, we've disconnected it to that land building process. And so these wetlands have been eroding, subsiding, sinking. And that's further stressed by um, increased saltwater intrusion. So these are all freshwater wetlands built by the freshwater of the Mississippi River. But when we build shipping and navigation channel, oil and gas channels, that saltwater from the Gulf of Mexico is an easier pathway to get into the, into the interior parts of the wetlands um, and stress that vegetation. And then when you have hurricanes coming through, it tears apart the marsh. And now we're facing the, the prospects of sea level rise. So. This is a very challenged landscape and our bottom and hardwood forests um, are at the edge of this coastal um, coastal region being um, being stressed by being closer to the Gulf of Mexico. And so one of these important bottom and hardwood forests and swamps in South Louisiana is called Morapa Swamp. Um, it was actually clear cut like many of the swamps of the southeastern United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s, but it was still connected to the river, the, the Mississippi River, and it regenerated naturally um, about 80 years ago. Um, but then we built the levee system and disconnected the swamp from the river. And so it, like many places in South Louisiana, has been slowly sinking. And it's gotten to the point where it is permanently inundated with water which prevents cypress and tupelo from regenerating. So it is, it is what we call a relic forest. It will only deteriorate, it will not rebuild unless we rebuild the ecological processes that um, created this swamp in the first place. And that is by connecting it to the river. It is the second largest contiguous forest in Louisiana. And it's also an important bird area in part because of the number of prothonotary warblers that it supports. Fortunately, this Morpa Swamp area, as well as other swamps in the adjacent region, um, are well protected uh, and permanently protected as public land through our wildlife management area system. The Morpa Swamp area has doubled um, because of donations and acquisitions since 2001. And a large part of that had to do with nominating the site as an important bird area which got the attention of some important land developers that decided to donate the land instead of trying to develop it. Um, and um, Audubon and the Nature Conservancy and the Conservation Fund and the uh, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries all work together to put um, these land into permanent conservation. But that only means so much 
if we can if we can restore the habitat. And fortunately, we have a plan to do that. It's called the Morapa Swamp River Reintroduction Project. It will cost about $130 million, but it will restore about 45,000 acres. And so here you can see um, a channel, a conveyance channel from the Mississippi River. There will be a water control structure along the levee of the Mississippi River that will um, be operated to divert um, water and sediment from the river back into the swamp. There were point count surveys, bird surveys that were done throughout this influence area, this potential influence area back in the early 2000s, from 2003 to 2005. And so we worked with them, those previous researchers, and set a plan to revisit those point count sites in 2019 and 2020. There were 60 different points that we tried to access through the, through the swamp, and we repeatedly surveyed those to give us an index of the bird numbers. Um, and to see how that might have changed over the last 15 years or so. Um, and so the way you do a point count as a bird or, you know, as a birder, as an ornithologist, as a, you know, field technician, is you basically keep track of all the birds you see in here. And we were keeping track of them in bands of 0 to 25, 25 to 50, and 50 to 100 meters. Um, that allows you to do all kinds of really cool math. I'm not going to get into the details um, to get you an estimate of, of bird density for different species. And so this is what a data sheet might look like. It's got birds all over it with lines and how they're moving around. And you do that count for 10 minutes and then move on to your next location to do to, to repeat that count at a different place. And then you repeat it throughout the summer over a couple of years. And then of course we were doing it over, over these two very different time spans. And basically this is what we found for prothonotary warblers. And the short of it is that their population had dropped by about 50% in just 15 years. Excuse me. Um, which of course is much faster than the background rate of declines. And so the, the deteriorating swamp definitely has um, uh, an impact on not only this bird, but a whole bunch of other swamp specialists. That include prothonotary warbler, northern perula, yellow-throated warbler, yellow-billed cuckoo, and yellow-throated vireo. A whole bunch of these other generalist species actually showed no change over this 15-year time period. And in fact, Carolina chickadees um, increased a little bit. So um, something is definitely going on in the swamp that's affecting those specialists. And um, one of the things we know that this is telling us is that we need restoration. So going back to that Morapa Swamp Restoration Timeline, this project was conceptualized by a funding program that we call QIPRA. Um, it actually approved the project for engineering and design funding just two years later, which is remarkably fast. It was included in, in a comprehensive coastal master plan that the state of Louisiana puts together every six years. Um, but unfortunately, it was just deemed too uh, expensive for the Quipper program, so they deauthorized it. But it was still lingering there in the master plan, needing a home, needing funding. Uh, it was continued to be included in the 2017 master plan. And then we uh, found a way to use Deepwater Horizon oil spill funds to uh, fund um, the, the construction of this project, that $130 million price tag. But there was a problem. Um, there was a supplemental EIS, an environmental impact statement, um, where the Army Corps of Engineers was basically stonewalling the project. Um, there was a, an opportunity to use it as a mitigation for a levee that was being built near, near New Orleans, but the Army Corps basically rejected that proposal and, and basically put a hold on this project. Um, so Audubon and our coalition partners at the Mississippi, uh, the Restore the Mississippi River Coalition, we mobilized our membership, we mobilized our volunteers, our um, advocates, and we submitted 30,000 letters to the Army Corps um, to say that they need to use the Morapa project as mitigation for that levy. And in the final in EIS, the Army Corps agreed to do it. So we were able to help move this project forward, which is now gonna go into construction as early as this year. 
So we're super excited about that. This is a major, um, a major win in conservation uh, for this important habitat, for this important bird. Um, actually, this bird was photo, this specific photograph was taken in Moripah Swamp when I first learned about it moving to Louisiana in 2003. Um, this actually this was 2004 when this photo was taken. And um, I fell in love with prothonotaries then, and it's really cool to kind of see the, the progress that has been made over these years um, to get more of swamp uh, for funding. So that wraps up my talk on prothonotaries. Thank you so much for coming. Here's my contact information. If you'd ever like to reach out, if you have questions, if you're interested in nest mox monitoring, um, anything, you know, happy to happy to answer questions. So thanks so much. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's hear some questions. Yeah. And you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask the question that way instead of typing. <clears throat> I had two questions. One, how can we help Northern Columbia? <laughs> Go burning there is one. Support, uh -huh. support ecotourism in Columbia. You know, the government already has made statements that it recognizes Columbia as being the most species rich country in the world, um, which it is. And um, Columbia is, you know, they left the 50 year civil war they've settled, they, they are moving forward with in, in a new era of economic development, of um, ecotourism, of um, bird conservation. Um, they recognize that, that ecotourism has to be a part of their economy. And so that's one way to support it. Um, how else to support them is tough um from a like on the ground advocacy standpoint um it's it's a little bit more challenging there are organizations like selva who's part of the um selva uh, it, uh i forget the full name it's like selva conservation for the tropics or something but they're based in Colombia, um and they do it they're sort of like they're, they're the sort of like a um, a mini Audubon, right? They're a mini um, conservation organization in the country. They do a lot of bird science, but they also are really well connected to local governments, uh, to decision makers, and to the national government. Um, they have a project right now where they're working with several national parks on the northern part of the country that are trying to restore mangroves, um, and they're trying to do it right. And so Selva is providing information on how to do that. Um, how to plant the trees, how to space them. Um, there's just a lot that, you know, you would think that they would know how to restore mangroves, but we kind of don't, like that's that's still new science. And so Selva is working with them to, to help figure that out. So supporting those kinds of conservation organizations with your dollars, right, um, with your donations is a, is a good way to support conservation in Colombia as well. So mangrove is the primary habitat where they are there? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, they can be. I, I, um, I did get to do a trip uh, in northern Colombia a couple of years ago, and it's it's remarkable. Um, like I said, you know, the entire breeding range concentrates into 20 percent of the area, and a lot of that is mangrove swamp. They form these communal roosts that can be hundreds of birds. And so in the mornings when they're leaving their roosts and going to their day foraging areas, it's just like swarms of prothonotaries moving through these trees. It's absolutely spectacular. Um, so, and they, you know, northern water thrushes and um, black pole warblers and all kinds of stuff. Or, you know, a lot of our birds are in northern Colombia in the winter. So, it's just a really important place. There's tons of endemism. Like, there are hummingbirds found in those mangrove swamps in northern Colombia that are found nowhere else on the planet. So, it's it's just a really amazing place. If, if you've never been to to Colombia, I highly recommend it. It's not expensive. Um, the people are super friendly, it's safe, it's it's just a wonderful place to go. Wow, okay. And then uh, how do we hear geolocators relate to MODIS? And they're two different tracking technologies. MODIS is a, um, a network of receiving stations 
basically uh, you would put what's called a nano tag on a bird. A nano tag sim transmits a frequency at a certain wavelength that is programmed to be received by all of those mo moda stations. What makes the tag unique to an individual bird is that there is a code embedded within the pulse, within that, within that ping. And that code is transcribed by a computer within the MODIS station that identifies that unique tag and therefore that unique bird. Um, with those nano tags, you don't need to recover those a year later to get your data. You just need those birds to fly close to a MODIS station. And so that's the limiting factor is like where there aren't MODIS stations, it's not going to, you're not going to get data for, for those birds. Um, but that MODIS network is growing not only across the U.S. and Canada, but throughout Latin America as well. Um, so that's another, you know, potential way of supporting the science of bird migration in, in Latin America is to help support the construction of and maintenance of a, of a MODIS station or do one locally. Um, a lot of a lot of Audubon chapters across the network are, are, are investing in a local MODIS station that they maintain. And our national science staff at National Audubon are helping support that in various ways. So if that's something that your chapter is interested in, there may be resources to help set up and train you on how to maintain a MODIS station. So a geolocator doesn't transmit any data. It all stores it on, on the unit. And so you have to get that data from the bird a year later. And so birds, you know, don't make the migration. They die. Um, but the ones that come back, you get the data for. So there's a little bit of a bias there, too, that you're only getting, quote unquote, the best birds when you use geolocator data. So that's why we also wanted to use that isotope data, because that doesn't require any recapturing. Um, you can sample a lot more birds. And it was encouraging that we got a very similar result from that, um, along with the geolocator data. OK. Well, I'm seeing the chat. A lot of wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. And several congratulations on the Maripas restoration. It's quite a achievement. And somebody asked if there are warblers that breed in Florida, and and we can answer that. That yes, they did. North okay. Northern Florida, right? Yes, Central Florida. It's just about it's the lower limit from where we've ever seen them. Yeah. Yeah. So this gives us good information. But maybe we can help learning more about them. Yeah. Well, if y'all ever have any questions, I'm an email away. That's wonderful. That's awesome. All right. Thanks again, Eric. Thank okay. you. Okay. Y'all have a great evening. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Okay.